In Belgium, Field Marshal Montgomery decorates 90 Canadians for bravery in the field. Distinguished service orders go to a group of officers for outstanding service, including Lieutenant Colonel Roberts of an infantry brigade, Lieutenant Colonel McTavish, CRE of a division, Lieutenant Colonel M.M.B. Gordon of an armored regiment. Major V.O. Walsh receives his decoration, together with Major W.D. Brooks and Captain J.S. Woodward of a machine gun regiment. To Honorary Captain Jameson goes the Military Cross, to CSM Howes the Military Medal, as well as to Lance Sergeant Bartolacci, Lance Corporal Moss of the Canadian Provo Corps, and to Private H.L. Fraser. 3,000 soldiers of the Canadian Division cheer their decorated comrades in arms. <laughs> In London, the Premier of Poland decorates Lieutenant General Quirar with a Virtuti Militari. The award for field gallantry is made in recognition of General Quirar's success in the battle for Caen and Falaise. The Belgian ambassador to Canada, Baron Robert Silvercroix, arrives in his native capital. It is his first visit since the outbreak of war. To correspondence, he outlines his aims for his country's reconstruction. Cardinal Villeneuve arrives in Brussels to visit Canadian troops. He receives an enthusiastic welcome from padres of the Army and Air Force. His eminence brings with him messages of cheer from the folks back home. In the 1st Canadian Army, even the padres attend refresher courses. Mostly D-Day men, they gather in Brussels to receive the latest theological news. It is a welcome interlude in the hard life of campaigning shared with the fighting men by their spiritual friends, the padres. In Italy, Major General Luton, OBE, MC of Vancouver, the Director of Medical Services, is welcomed by officers and matrons of the Canadian Army Medical Corps. He is on a tour of inspection of the various medical units of the 1st Canadian Corps. The systems for handling and hospitalizing Canadian wounded are inspected by the medical chief. He expresses satisfaction at the work of his efficient medical staff. <laughs> Behind the front lines in northern Italy is a pleasant Canadian rest camp. On well-earned leave, Johnny Canuck can peel off the mud and the equipment and settle down to a life of Riley, with no sleeping in slip trenches and ducking Jerry 88. Reminiscent of ye old saloon bar in the mucky duck on a Saturday night, where the touch of the windmill theater thrown in for good measure, there is never a dull moment. Canadian troopers at the Bandoliers' concert party roll them in the aisles. We found a different band. Our tents in a row, we pitched in the soldiers like real vulgar men. After ten easy lessons, you too could learn to dance the ballet. The exercise is recommended for old sergeant majors who wish to keep their girlish figures. The artistes have danced before crowned heads. They were crowned after. Look now, but there's a soprano in the house. Imported at great expense from the Metropolitan pool parlor, the prima donna owes her success to K rations and spam. <laughs> Big Chief Wahoo and his favorite squaw give out with a little reservation jive. Their Algonquin zoot suits are being worn in the best teepees this year. So life goes pleasantly on in the Adriatic Rest Camp. In London's Trafalgar Square, the Corps of Canadian Firefighters pass in farewell review. 400 firefighters from 107 Canadian towns and cities march by. All volunteers, they arrived in England in June 1942 to aid the severely taxed British National Fire Service. Canada's Vincent Massey and Britain's Herbert Morrison take the salute. The NFS band leads the parade. Having served in close cooperation with the NFS at Portsmouth, Southampton, Plymouth and Bristol, the Canadian firemen did valuable work in fighting blazes caused by enemy bombing and shelling. 
right now, with their job well done, they hold a farewell parade before returning home to Canada. With them go the thanks and goodwill of their brother firefighters of England. A Brussels mansion captured by the Allied armies turns out to be a large German map depot. Units of German intelligence stationed there had completed a thorough task. Their job was to keep complete files of maps of all the various parts of the British Isles. Era may consider herself neutral. Jerry seemed to have different ideas. The maps were amended regularly to keep them up to date. With each set of maps goes a handbook complete with pictures and data on the people of that part of the country. Designed for the 1940 invasion of Britain, their only use now will be as tourist guides to post-war England. That is, if anybody speaks German by that time. An artillery OPIP plane carries Canadian Army cameramen to view the terrible hazards which are being surmounted by the Canadians in their drive across the Low Country. The beaches in the Skelt estuary are a maze of mines and obstacles calculated to slow down our tortuous advance. Dikes have been blown, flooding the whole countryside. Only main roads provide a route for armor and transport. The remainder is a bottomless morass. Despite the mud, flood and torrential rains, the Canadians on the left flank steadily plow forward on their mission to tidy the line and free Antwerp. While Canadian infantry attack west across the Valkyrie Causeway from Babeland, two seaborne attacks are launched against the Nazis' last remaining Skelt strong point. From Ostend, British commandos, supported by the full might of the Navy, thrust toward the western approaches of Valkyrie Island. Bomber Command prepares the way with a carpet of high explosives. Meanwhile, on the south bank of the Skelt, at the port of Redskin, troops under the command of the 1st Canadian Army massed to support the attack already underway across the estuary. As the attack mounts in fury, casualties are brought back across the Skelt. A steady stream of supplies and reinforcements adds to the arm of steel thrusting into German positions. support the attack by laying down a terrible barrage around our beachhead. Of 240 millimeter caliber, firing shells weighing 360 pounds, the super heavies hit their stride in the rhythm of annihilation. fiercely resists our landing. Under cover of smoke, the landing craft are under constant fire from enemy artillery as they near their objectives. Once again, our landing technique, learned on D-Day, takes care of Jerry on the beaches. Flushing is captured. The coastal dike from Vescapella to Flushing is overrun. Most important of all, the last of the guns which could fire on the Skelt estuary is destroyed. All that remains is the mopping up of the portion of Valkyrie still above water. The unsung heroes of the war, the stretcher bearers, carry on their work of mercy. Tirelessly working day and night, they evacuate the wounded from forward areas. With the Skelt area under our control, there is no rest yet for the 1st Canadian Army. Montgomery's left flank must be advanced. Though the island hopping continues, 